But Swami said to do Kalamrita, so we'll do Kalamrita. And the bookmark is here on the beginning of chapter 13, The Master and Emma. It is August 19, 1883. It was Sunday, the first day after the full moon. I think Wednesday was full moon, right? So we're pretty close to that now. Sri Ramakrishna was resting after his noon meal. The midday offering had been made in the temples and the temple doors were closed. In the early afternoon, the master sat up on the small couch in his room. M prostrated himself before him and sat on the floor. The master was talking to him on the philosophy of Vedanta. Master to M. Self knowledge is discussed in the Ashtavakra Samhita. This is a very interesting book, Ashtavakra Samhita, but it's not one that Sri Ramakrishna spoke of to everybody. Usually it was just Narendra, but here he's talking to M. Self knowledge is discussed in the Ashtavakra Samhita. The non dualists say Soham, that is, I am the Supreme Self. Actually, the expression Soham is just is a combination of Saha Aham. I am He. And uh, that we can ask who is that He? The implication is it refers to Brahman, um, but not in a gender sense. That word He is not used in a gender sense, but in a generic sense. That's why in another one of the um, Mahavakya Tattvamasi is Tat, not he or she, that. So, that is, I am the Supreme Self. This is the view of the sannyasis of the Vedantic school. But this is not the right attitude for householders who are conscious of doing everything themselves. Now, here the uh, Remember the distinction he's making, you know, about sannyasi and householder. Understand what he's really saying. He's saying this is the view of the sannyasi or the Vedanta school, but this is not the right attitude for householders. You can remove the word householders. What he's really saying is not the right attitude for those who are conscious of doing everything themselves, that is, who have the feeling of ownership or agency. For such people, it's contradictory, you see, to say, I am here, it's going to create, it will be problematic. And therefore, only one who has, who's working at effacing their ego, their idea, they are the agents of, uh, of action. For such people, whether they are sannyasis in the formal sense or householders in the formal sense, uh, the idea of Sahom is okay. But as long as we have the feeling that um, we are the ones who are making the decision, then that is not a good attitude, he says. Right attitude for house, it is not the right attitude for householders who are conscious of doing everything themselves. That being so, how can they declare, I am that, the actionless supreme self? So you may say, what's wrong? Okay, if I think I'm the agent, I am uh, initiating action, uh, then what's wrong in declaring I am the supreme self? Because the supreme self doesn't act whole concept of action is impossible without desire. There is no reason to act unless there is a desire. And in the Supreme Self, in Brahman, there is no desire. And so that's the contradiction that will develop in, in oneself. <clears throat> According to the non-dualists, the Self is unattached. Good and bad Virtue and vice, and the other pairs of opposites, cannot in any way injure the self, though they undoubtedly afflict those who have identified themselves with their bodies. It's interesting that for the non-dualist, you see that the self, uh, that the uh, spirit, we might say, so he's talking about the atma, 
is unattached. And so it is not, cannot be described as good. It's neither good nor bad. You can't describe it as virtuous. It has neither virtue nor vice. These are pairs of opposites. They cannot in any way injure the self. In fact, there's no connection to this. But they undoubtedly afflict those who have identified themselves with their body. That is, those who um, have a, believe the duality as real, whether we say it in words or we don't say it in words. You know, in words we may say we are non dualists but in, in action and in terms of um, how and conviction, if we accept that dualism, then uh, it, 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 um, it, will, it, it will enter the self. What you feel to be real is real. Actually, Ashtavakra Samhita also says that. What you, your concept of reality, as in whatever you hold as real, will affect you. So if you believe in the uh, reality of good and bad, virtue and vice, and who amongst us doesn't? You know, we live in a world of dualism, whatever philosophy you may espouse. Uh, so we all believe there's a difference between good and bad, virtue and vice, and then they will uh, affect, affect us. They undoubtedly afflict those who have identified themselves with their body. And what is the, what is the root of our dualism? It is uh, uh, what this book will tell us. The root is ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of our self, our identity. Who are we? We feel we are something which is other than what we are. And as a result of that, uh, all these other things come. They undoubtedly afflict those who have identified themselves with their bodies. Smoke soils the ball, certainly. But it cannot in any way affect Akasha. Or space. So you light um, a fire inside a closed room, there will be some soot on the on the ceiling and on the wall. And if you do that regularly, you'll see it. But the space, what he's saying is the space, if you can imagine, this requires some uh, imagination, uh, space itself is not tainted by that. Space is a really very interesting thing to contemplate, especially those who like a uh, um, in the non-dual uh, ideal, because space is neither concrete nor abstract, it is something in between, and you can't define it. You try to define space, you cannot. Actually, you can't even define time. These are, these are things that we, we, we think we're comfortable with, but actually if you probe, it's very hard to define. So he's using space, it is, uh, it's there, it's real, we accept that it's real, and yet it is untouched. So smoke soils the wall, certainly, but it cannot in any way affect Bhagasha or space. Following the Vedantis of this class, Krishna Kishore used to say, I am Kha, Kha meaning Akasha. You know, in Ramana, the word Khastiti Rasarada. Uh, the Sarada has already died, and uh, he's uh, looking uh, from above, so to speak, of, of how Rama is doing. But he is uh, absorbed in Kha, or in, in the space. So Krishna Kishore was a devotee. He used to say, I am Kha, meaning Akasha. Being a great devotee, <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting thing, this character of Krishna Kishore. Being a great devotee, he could say that with some justification, but it is not becoming for others to do so. But also Krishna Kishore, you remember once he had some problems, financial problems, and then he was very worried. Once Sri Ramakrishna visited him and he looked about it and he asked him, what's the matter? He says, the tax collector was here. And he says, if he doesn't, um, um, if I don't pay my taxes, he's going to take all my utensils. So he has no other assets again. <laughs> but, and, and then Sri Ramakrishna says to him, but why? You're the one who says you're a what, what do you have to do with the utensils? <laughs> Let them take the utensils. I am Ka, meaning, meaning, meaning the point is, it is good to know these things and have this high ideal and even to meditate on it. But remember, life has its own reality too. And so we live in, we live in a world of duality and we have to uh, adjust to that reality as well. But still, Sri Krishna doesn't criticize me. He says, being a great devotee, he could say that with some justification. But it is not becoming for others to do so. But to feel that one is a free soul is very good. By constantly repeating, I am free, I am free, a man 
where lip becomes free. This is straight from Ashtavakra. On the other hand, by constantly repeating, I am bound, I am bound, he certainly becomes bound to worldliness. The fool who says only, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, barely drowns himself in worldliness. One should rather say, I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? How can I be bound? This is very important, extremely important, this paragraph. It is uh, goes to the heart of a lot of what Salah Krishna teaches. That it is the, the positive approach that is going to transform us. Uh, and Swami Vekand also says this. Yes, there, there may be um, dirt, but will washing dirt with dirt purify it? Wash dirt with pure water, some pure water, then you'll, you'll be able to purify it. So there, there, there are some blemishes, there is some negativity. As a result of past actions, past ways of thinking, we're all guilty of that. But what will you do about it? See, the, the point is, you can say, oh, how, what has the great sinner am I have done so many wrong things? But here he's telling uh, that, no, rather you should say, you've chanted the name of God. The most purifying of sounds, the most purifying of thoughts. How, in that context, then can you call yourself a sinner? I should rather, I should rather say, I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? How can I be bound? This is a very, very powerful and important attitude and it will help us a lot if we understand this. If many times, uh, the students, even the students of Ramakrishna asked him how they could overcome certain obstacles. And, and his advice is very different from actually even advice that you get in books like this. He says, you know, turn the course of the mind. Mind is flowing in a certain direction. As a result of which you become habituated to a certain way of thinking. Turn the course of the mind. That same mind that has been thinking in this way is capable of thinking in another way. So turn the flow of the mind. The, the point is, that is a positive thing. You cannot cure negativity with negativity. But it's true. Of course, minus times minus does gives you plus. That's true. But that's different. That's math. In general, you cure negativity by positivity. And that's even find this, even if you don't want to go as, as esoteric as uh, you know, deep things of spiritual life, even if you're a teacher you know, or if you're a parent, you're trying to encourage your children or your students, you have to be positive. It's not mean it doesn't mean that you're you're naive or stupid or don't see the problems, you see everything. But how do you react to it? If you do it in a positive way, people have a chance to turn uh, their mind into a positive direction. Uh, and Swami Vekaranda elaborates on this a lot, especially when he talks about education. You, know, you keep telling children that they are no good or they are not able to do this, not able to do that. Well, they actually, that becomes a reality. You rather hold up to them an ideal of potential, hold up to them an ideal of possibilities, and that's what they start to manifest. So that is a, that's the big responsibility of parents and teachers from childhood, from the very tiny child, even before you think the child is even at an age where they can understand what you're saying. You, uh, what you say and do is extremely important. Uh, to be positive and to fill them with the ideas of positivity, great ideals, great possibilities, great potentialities is very important. So the, 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 the lullabies that mothers sing to their children when they're young, when they're babies, that's extremely important. You'll remember them. They, go, they get into you and they will guide your actions. So remember this, that if you are ever in a position of uh, that kind of responsibility, you can not only do you have to be positive, but put forward high ideals. And even if you think the person in front of you is at a stage where they won't understand fully, it doesn't matter. Still put high ideals. Because those will come. Remember, at the back of everybody is the same Atma. Whatever stage we are at in terms of manifesting or not being able to manifest, the Atma never disappears. That is there and that is our true identity. So even if the uh, 
uh, manifested being doesn't look ca- like it's capable of understanding what you're doing, still you must follow that. Manifestation, you know, is, is a mysterious thing. I remember uh, in uh, Swami Sarvagatana used to tell us that when, when he had just come to the West and Swami Akhilananda was, was still alive, he was the, uh, the previous Swami in Boston and Toronto. Uh, Swami Akhilananda you know, fell quite ill and eventually went into a coma. But um, Swami Sarvagatananda used to uh, attend on him as much as he could in the hospital. And when he had to leave, he, he'd lean over close to Swami and say, Swami, I'm going now, but I'll be back later. And the others used to laugh at that, saying, why are you talking to him? He cannot hear. He's in a coma. Swami was convinced that no, that consciousness is there, that being inside is there. He may not be able to express it, but uh, that being is there. And so he was treating it with, with all of the reality and respect that it deserves. And, and so he was talking to it. So that's the, an that's the important responsibility for all of us. Now, here's this is the approach that Ramakrishna is taking. Let's read this paragraph again. It's extremely important, this paragraph. To feel that one is a free soul is very good. By constantly repeating, I am free, I am free, a man rarely becomes free. On the other hand, by constantly repeating, I am bound, I am bound, he certainly becomes bound to worldliness. A fool who says only, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, rarely drowns himself in worldliness. One should rather say, I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? How can I be bound? And you will see in the the lives of great people, this translated into action. Uh, I'm going to remind you of one incident I'm sure you all know about in the life of Holy Mother. Uh, There was a time when, um, I guess in her household, that's the strange thing about Holy Mother is everything appears in the a normal household. So she's there and somebody had to wash their hands. We're not told why, but you can sort of guess why. And there was no water available. And she said, then, then uh, the problem was this person had to wash their hands and then go into the kitchen and cook. Now this number of holy mother, pure, pure you know, definition of purity. And she has to cook in that kitchen, that person. So what does she say? There's no water. What should I do? She says, then touch me. Touch one mother. That idea of identifying the purity is so strong that one mother could say with all conviction, you touch me, you will be purified. I said, no, you go into the kitchen. Can you imagine that? See, that, 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 is, the, the, that is what... Uh, why? When, when these things become real to us, it, it not only it, does it affect the way we act and the way we act, but, but we, can com- we can communicate that reality to others too. Swami Vivekananda also, when uh, he was teaching a class in the old government, um, he was saying, he was talking about the class, he was saying, he was talking about Brahman, he said, and then he sort of got into that mood. Brahman is real. Can you feel it? You know, can you see it? You can't see it, but can you feel it? And he said it with such ferocity and conviction that everybody became transfixed for a time and went into a state they couldn't understand what it was. Even Swami Turiyananda was coming back, Brahmananda, from his bath. And uh, he, he became transfixed in that. So that the point is, when you have that full conviction, not only does it transform you, but you have the power to transform Others also to communicate that. So therefore, in for yourself, for your for your own sake, and for the sake of those who are in your care, your children or your students, uh, you have to have this very very positive way of thinking about yourself, your identity. One should rather say, "I have chanted the name of God. How can I be a sinner? How can I be bound?" To him. You see, I am very much depressed today. This is how Krishna is saying, I am very much depressed today. 
Hriday has written me that he is very ill. Why should I feel dejected about it? Is it because of Maya or Daya? So he is feeling a little unhappy because Hriday is ill. And now he's asking him, as he is often to do this, you know, he asks other people, why should I feel dejected about it? Is it because of Maya or Daya? Is it compassion or confusion? Which is it? Emma could not find suitable words for a reply and remained silent. Master, do you know what Maya is? It is attachment to relatives. I'm saying it because he's feeling that way about, about who they It is attachment to relatives, parents, brother and sister, wife and children, nephew and niece. Daya means love for all created beings. Now what is this? Like feeling about Hriday. Is it Maya or Daya? So uh, be careful here a little bit. So my, he says Maya is attachment to relatives, parents, brother and sister, wife and children, nephew and niece. That doesn't mean now as we on this we want to go beyond Maya. So now we are not going to think about it. No. It, 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 if you understood the previous paragraph, if you understand Sri Krishna's approach to spiritual life, it is not by rejecting anything. It is by accepting everything. Okay, so what he's saying is that love, that affection that you feel for your family, for your relatives, feel it for everybody. Not reject your family, but include everybody. Everybody is in the family. That's what Sri Krishna's Holy Mother says. No one is a stranger. People that you feel close to actually now make in, increase that family. Also, this is what Swami um, Kalyanananda told Swami Sarugakananda, who uh, just joined the Kankalashram at that time and um, was feeling quite free. You know, he was like this. <laughs> so uh, he's, uh, I'm, uh, he's feeling, he was feeling quite free, you know, and, uh, I'm free constantly, yeah. So he was feeling he's not connected to Nana, but he's an earlier. Um, according to the non dualist the self is unattached, you see, so it's not connected to anything. It's feeling completely free as a young brahmachari. And Kalyananda asked him, um, before you joined the order, who, how many people in your family? He told him, I had a brother. Um, siblings, I guess. And I think I remember is he had a brother, and he said, "Now, but and what about now? Then now I'm free." <laughs> he said, "No, you have forty brothers. You had one brother before. Now you have forty brothers. 40. We have to imagine there were forty monks, like some number. It's not rejection. It's expansion, expansion, expansion. This is actually a novel idea." It's not to say that um, uh, somehow everybody is, uh, you know, this, uh, sometimes you get it in Shankaracharya. <laughs> he lived at a different time, had a different way of expressing himself. You know, the world is full of snakes. And the, the, you find that those kind of expressions. No, the world is not full of snakes. People. And uh, we have our loved ones, our family, our friends. Keep all of them. But expand it. Expand it to include more and more. The whole world is your family, if you can feel like that. Okay, so anyway, he's saying, do you know what Maya is? It is attachment to relatives, parents, brother and sister, wife and children, nephew and niece. So they were his nephew. Maya means love for all created beings. Now, what is this? My feeling about Hride, is it Maya or Naya? And then he goes on and answers himself, but Hride did so much for me. <laughs> what did he say? So he's feeling bad about something. Hriday did so much for me. You know how Hriday left. Uh, he was his personal attendant, amazing. Uh, we owe Hriday a lot. You know, he took care of Sri Krishna during a very critical time. And uh, in, in general, we don't know how spiritual he was, but he had extreme presence of mind. And so a lot of things for uh, uh, Sri Ramakrishna he could take care of. So Hriday did some, but then he did something wrong about 
Muslim and then he was asked to leave. And he also tormented uh, Ramakrishna at one point. This is a dangerous thing, you see, when you're with, with a personal attendant of a great person, sometimes we don't understand it's a huge, huge privilege. And so we, we not fail to understand that maybe we try to think we are in a position of power. <laughs> And they do something wrong. So he really fell into that trap. Reading that story for today is a morning for us. That's all. Whenever you see these kind of things in these uh, uh, documents, remember, uh, you know, it's not to criticize today or think less of him, but thank him that we don't fall into that trap. <clears throat> so, so Hriday did so much for me. He served me wholeheartedly and nursed me when I was ill. But later he tormented me also. The torment became so unbearable. What does it, how can he torment him? It's just this idea of control. Trying to control, does he stand up, does he sit down, who gets to see him, who gets to see him, that kind of thing. He later he tormented me also. The torment became so unbearable that once I was about to commit suicide by jumping into the Ganga from the top of the embankment. So it must have gone quite, quite uh, far for Sri Ramakrishna to feel that way. But he did much to serve me. Now my mind will be at rest if he gets some money. So there was a need of some money. But whom shall I ask for it? So he's, he's sort of was like a soliloquy in his own mind. He's torn. If you that can't ignore him, we must take care of him. But look, he also made mistakes. Whom shall I ask for it? See, Sri Ramakrishna asking for money. What is money to him? He's the one who did the clay, the rupee. Um, whom shall I ask for it? Who likes to speak about such things to our rich visitors? He also knows the nature of people. You know, the moment you ask for money, you introduce a so your connection goes in a certain direction. Who likes to speak about such things to our rich visitors? Now there's a gap. We have to imagine because next end says, at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, Adhar Sen and Balram arrived. After saluting Sri Ramakrishna, they sat on the floor and asked him if he was well. The master said, Yes, I'm well physically, but a little troubled in mind. He did not refer to Hriday and his trouble. Uh, it's interesting, if you have a visitor to this card man and he said he has a little troubled in mind, what would you say? What would be your reaction? Because usually people go to him with a troubled mind and he gives something. But he says he has a little troubled in mind, what would you say? You could sympathize. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the way. You're close to somebody. Somebody you look up to, they, they say they're troubled. You naturally can I do something to help? What's the problem? Even though we're we're tiny beings compared to him, still we feel that way. You know, when even children when they go to their parents and their parents look troubled, they can help you. But but they don't ask that. At least if they did, it's not recorded. He says, "Yes, I am well physically, but a little troubled in mind." He did not refer to today and his troubles. The conversation turned to the goddess Simhavahini. <laughs> well, so you have to imagine, sort of, you have to wonder about these people who visit Master, yes, I visited the goddess, which means somebody must have asked him, did you visit Simhavahini? <laughs> he just said he was troubled in mind and nobody asked him why. Yes, I visited the goddess. She is worshipped by one of the branches of the Malik family of Calcutta. This branch of the family is <laughs> this branch of the family is now in strange circumstances, and the house they live in is dilapidated. The walls and floor are spotted with moss and pigeon droppings, and the cement and plaster are crumbling. But other branches of the Malik family are well off. This branch has no signs of prosperity. Strange, the conversation is a little strange. But what you can deduce from that is what's going on in his mind. He 
is torn, he is troubled, he is worried about Hriday, he wants to help him. On the other hand, who does he ask? He is being, you know, Sri Ramakrishna was both a householder and a sannyasi. As a sannyasi, he is not going to ask anybody for money. And on the other hand, these guys don't raise it. They say, did you go and see some mobile money? <laughs> so, uh, other than this branch has no signs of prosperity. To them, well, what does that signify? See, what does it signify? It says, you have a, a Mollick family, it had many branches, big family, and um, this god of Sinhawani is worshipped by one of the branches, and he went there. He went there, but, but their house was all dilapidated. He tells all that. And the other branches of the Mollick family are well off. This branch has no signs of prosperity. Well, what does that signify? M remains silent. Now again, Master flips to another side. The thing is that everyone must reap the results of his past karma. He's talking about today. The thing is that everyone must reap the result of his past karma. One must admit the influence of tendencies inherited from past births and the result of the power of the karma. Nevertheless, yes. nevertheless, in that dilapidated house, I saw the face of the goddess radiating a divine light. One must believe in the divine presence in the image. Very interesting, you can see how his mind is tossing him. So he says, uh, very important thing here, let's talk a little bit about this. Everyone must reap the result of his past karma. So we know the theory of karma. Karma is about cause and effect. If you get a cause, it will produce an effect. Now, we think uh, karma belongs to us. We did an act, therefore we will get the result. Actually, karma belongs to your ego. The moment your ego changes, your karma changes. So it's not a, as naive a thing as you might think. Everyone must read the result of his past karma. That is why, yes, you, you have an action, there will be an effect. But you see, to, to whom will that effect come? Suppose you throw, hmm? who identifies with that action? And that's why, you see, the way that that whole business of karma yoga is to sever the identification. That's why in Kanamrita, uh, you tell them there's the story of Yasa and the Kopis. Remember that? He wants to cross the whole river. He eats a lot of butter and he says, if I didn't eat any butter, look the water. The point is, it is identification that's the key. We feel ourselves to be the doers. We have this sense of agency that you talked about earlier. I'm doing something. Then that fine. You get the consequence of that. The moment that feeling of I am the doer changes, the consequence changes. Therefore, the whole point of spiritual life, you know, our, our feeling we are, we are devotees, the repetition of God's name, what it is, is it's, what do you think it's doing? It is changing your concept of yourself. Therefore, it is changing what your ego is. Therefore, it's changing your karma. And that's why Holy Mother says, you, a person who repeats God's name, their karma changes. Maya herself crosses off what she has written about it. But how, you know, how can that be? Because the thing to come has to figure out to whom it will it come. Whose karma is it? You're not the same person anymore. Through your spiritual thought, your spiritual perspective, you've become something different. 
and therefore is not so naive. This cause and effect, this karma business, is not so naive. I did this, therefore that happened. You have no idea. On top of that, here's another thing. We are not acting in isolation. We never do. We affect each other a lot. Everything we do, it's a very complex system. You know, you've heard of this idea of complex system. In, uh, I can give you this uh, example of how complex systems can arise very easily. If you have a planet orbiting the, the sun, or some fixed thing, and you, you say, what is the shape of that orbit? How would it go? Well, it depends on what's the force of attraction between the two bodies. Okay, let's say it's an inverse square law, as Newton said. Then you can prove mathematically that the shape of the orbit has to be elliptic. So planets, that's why we say planets orbit the sun in an elliptic orbit. And then people say, okay, that's a theorem, you can prove that, that's completely rigorous. Then they say, but look at the solar system, you know, these ten planets, they must all be moving in elliptical orbits. But wait a minute, that's not what, they, what was said. So, so now suppose instead I have one planet, I have two planets. If both are orbiting the, the same sun, in each case the sun is exerting the inverse square law attraction. But the problem is, these two bodies are also exerting an attraction. So, now try to solve it, and it becomes an extremely difficult mathematical problem. Now put a third planet, the problem is unsolved. Nobody knows how to solve this problem. So when we say, because we solve the problem for one planet orbiting, we know exactly what path it will take, then we extrapolate and we put ten planets there, they are all going to do the same thing. No, we don't know. We don't, we don't know, Man, even mathematically, forget spiritually, even mathematically we don't know what it's going to do. Now think of karma, cause and effect. Not one people, but billions of people. We're all affecting and pre-affecting each other. Even thought, even thought, my action, and then somebody says, uh, it is just don't know that, you don't do that, or that you shouldn't have done that. That is also an action which affects me. Uh, my action plus what I just heard, that also affects me. So with all these actions and reactions happening, what's the effect? We can't predict. So please don't take the karma theory in any naive sense. I did like this, therefore I'm getting like this. Yeah? It is not a naive thing at all. It's very complex. But the, but the one thing for sure is it depends on your ego. Therefore, if you change your ego, what you identify with, what you think of as real, your karma also changes. That is the point of spiritual capitalism. So here he says, um, everyone must read the results of his past karma. One must admit the influence of tendencies inherited from past births and the result of part of the karma. Yeah, the influence is there, but it is not to be taken in a naive way. This is also, by the way, another important thing. Yes, the influence of prarabdha is there, but it can only manifest when it's given an opportunity to manifest. So we have a certain tendency, let's say, because we have we've developed a certain kind of character and we behave in a certain way, so we tend to react in a certain way, let's say. But the problem is this, okay, so now you're, you're, you're born again, let's say, until you come to a point where it's possible for you to act in that way, it's dormant. And I come back again to the important, important, important role of parents and teachers. Because while those things are dormant, you have a chance to insert some musings. So at that point, if you put helpful, positive, strong, spiritual ideas, by the time this person grows up and tendencies that go on and start to manifest, they get checked. If, in case they're unhelpful tendencies, they get checked by the positive things that you planted when they were kids. That spiritual thought, that uh, devotional thoughts that you gave them when they were children, 
come up. Just as other karma tendencies also start coming, this also comes up. And so that's the greatest help we can do. Uh, I think even more I put the emphasis on parents and teachers. Because you have access to children at a very, very formative uh, age, even when the, before the child can speak. So uh, this whole business of karma is there. Yes, we have to take the consequences of our uh, tendencies inherited from past births and results of product of the karma. But, but there's a whole uh, science there about karma. Okay. Now, <laughs> now, yes, you have to take the, the consequence. Everyone must reap the results of his past karma. Nevertheless, in that dilapidated house, I saw the face of the goddess radiating the divine light. So, Krishna can't help but see that. So, even in the midst of that manifestation, which looks dilapidated, which looks foiled, Sri Ramakrishna could see uh, the face of the goddess radiating the divine light. One must believe in the divine presence in the image. Which image do you think he's talking about? One must believe in the divine presence in the image. He's talking about today. He's going, he's going back and forth in his thought. He's talking apparently about the goddess in the in the uh, house, but in the back of his mind is the problem with today. On the one hand, he caused me a lot of pain. He feels that pain too, but still, he says, one must believe in the divine presence of the image. Once I went to Vishnu, the Raja of that place has several fine temples. In one of them, there is an image of the Divine Mother called Brinmai. There are several lakes near the temple known as the Baalbhand, Krishna Bhand, and so on. In the water of one of the lakes, I could smell the ointments that women use for their hair. How do you explain that? I didn't know at that time that the women and devotees offer appointments to the goddess Nenmai while visiting her temple. So what he's saying is that the goddess is real. The devotees offer these ointments and the goddess has them and uh, is adorned with them. And so he could smell that there. He says, continuing to express, one must believe in the divine presence in the image. I didn't know at that time that the women devotees offer ointments to the goddess Nirmayi while visiting her temple. Near the lake, I went into Samadhi, though I had not yet seen the image in the temple. In that state, I saw the divine form from the waist up, rising from the water. He's able to see that. So, Several things he's telling us there. Firstly, that divine image is real. It, it bathes in that tank. It accepts that offerings of the devotees. And you can smell it. And he had that vision. Is it imagination or vision? We don't know. Probably. Huh? You know, a vision <laughs> also. <laughs> it's mystical, whatever it is. There are some things about Sri Krishna we don't try to explain. It's just, it is what he, what he says it is. No. He had a vision of Kali, right? And also, like, uh, at his level, at his stage, it was truth what he was really experiencing. So that is one attitude, and it's a, it's a good attitude to have. You can accept it like that, um, if, if, if that suits you. But, but i just tell you another thing. If it doesn't suit you, that's also okay. Uh, the point is this, that um, you you can think of Sri Ramakrishna according to your dem your, um, um, your demeanor, really. according to your understanding, to that extent you can think of Sri Ramakrishna. Some people, as I told you before, some people think he is the avatar of Rishta, some people think he is a good man. It will help you either way, according to what you are. Sri Ramakrishna himself said, you know, you take a jewel to an eggplant seller. That's it. You know, this many sales of eggplant. Not one more. He will add that. Not one more. 
Only a jeweler knows the value of the jewel. But nevertheless, uh, what I'm trying to say is that in spiritual life, it, it is important that we progress. And so, according to our understanding, according to our comfort, take it like that. If this doesn't make any sense to you, it's okay, you can leave it. And it's not sacrilegious to say, Sri Krishna is saying what Sri Krishna said. Swami uh, Saravaratnanda used to say, I think, actually, hold on, I think this Sri Krishna used to say this, cut the head and the tail. It's talking about fish, you know, the, the songs of Bengal. So all these uh, things are fish illusions, fish illusions. So you just cut the head and the tail, you know. So the point is, that I guess, when people eat fish, they, they cut the head and the tail, okay, so they just eat all the <laughs> And uh, so he says, don't worry about this. This mystical part, if it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. You, you can still benefit greatly from the functional stages. So anyway, in that state, I saw the divine form from the waist up, rising. From also, don't argue, by the way. If, if somebody um, says, yes, it's literally true, or somebody says it's not literally true, that's fine. According to your understanding, take it, it's okay. In the meantime, other devotees had arrived. It's a wireless conversation, it's about 2 or 3 in the afternoon. In the meantime, other devotees had arrived. Someone referred to the political revolution and civil war in Kabul. Afghanistan was in the news then too. A devotee said that Yaqub Khan, the Amir, Amir of Afghanistan, had been deported. He told the master that the Amir was a great devotee of God. Master. But you must remember that pleasure and pain are the characteristics of the embodied state. So immediately he took just what he wanted from that story and left the rest. He's not getting interested in a political discussion. He's saying yes, ups and downs. Pain and pleasure, this is the nature of the embodied state and the jiva. In Kavi Kankan's Chendi, it is written that Kalavir was sent to prison and a heavy stone placed on his chest. Yet Kalu was born as a result of a boon from the Divine Mother of the Universe. He is born to the boon, I mean, the special divine birth. Some devotee, I guess, must be mentioned in the Chandi. Um, a divine birth, it's a very special person, and yet he was sent to prison and with a heavy stone laid on, placed on his chest. So you, there's suffering, nobody escaped suffering. Pleasure and pain are inevitable when the soul accepts a body. And you see in Sri Krishna's life itself. It is uh, some people. Some people thought, you know, seeing that, they doubted he must be a holy person. If he is the avatar, why is he suffering in this way? Same thing about, by the way, Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in Jesus Christ's case, yes, and in, in Christ's case also, they said, uh, "Why can't you say that? yes? I can bring legions of angels to say." Even when I think Peter would, were trying to uh, help him, he said, get me back, stage or something. He didn't want him to help him. He wanted the events to unfold as they were. Also, you know, in uh, but this whole business of thinking that because a person can't cure themselves or uh, because they can't or because they won't cure themselves or because they won't uh, get themselves out of danger, that they are somehow lesser spiritually. It's a common thing, you see, it's a common thing. Max Mueller's daughter, Henrietta Mueller, at first was greatly devoted to Swami Vivekananda. Later, she disavowed him. She became um, disillusioned. Why? This man also falls ill. He has asthma. And uh, so, various things like that. that she felt that uh, this is not the sign of a, uh, of a realized person. Very interesting. Pleasure and pain are inevitable when the soul accepts the body. 
Again, take the case of Sri Manta, who is a great devotee. Though his mother, Kullana, was very much devoted to the Divine Mother, there was no end to his troubles. He was almost beheaded. So these must be stories from the Chandi. I don't, I don't know these characters. There was also the instance of the woodcutter, who was a great lover of the Divine Mother. She appeared before him and showed him much grace and love. But he had to continue his profession of wood hunting and earn his livelihood by that arduous work. Again, while Devaki, Krishna's mother, was in prison, she had a vision of God Himself endowed with four hands, holding mace, discus, conch shell, and robes. But with all that, she couldn't get out of prison. Now, all of these stories want to tell, don't be naive again about what, what spirituality is and divinity is. It, is. it is growth from within, not magic. They're not miracles. Magic, miracles, mystery. These are, these are different from spiritual life. Spiritual life is transformation of character. The greatest miracle, you want a miracle? The greatest miracle is a human being transformed into the divine. Transformation of character. And how do you know the human has been transformed into the divine? He again takes the um, Holy Mother's criterion. How do you know somebody has experienced God? The person becomes unselfish, all loving, deeply concerned for the well being of others. No magic, no two horns, no mystery. The whole point of spiritual life is for the human to be transformed into the divine. What does it mean? To become all loving, concerned about people, unselfish, that is it. And such people may be persecuted. Such people may have run into all kinds of problems. So if 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 the goal is to have a comfortable life, there's a way to do it. There's a way to get a comfortable life. Without pursuing our, our careers and all these things, why? I mean, we want to certain comfort in our life. Religion is not about that. Spiritual life is not about that. It's about wanting to know the truth. It's about wanting to know when something bothers you, what is real? What, who am I in reality? Those kind of things, when they bother you, then spiritual life starts. And the answers to those questions are not in some magic, but in transformation. Ordinary, ordinary person becomes extraordinary, not because they can, uh, you know, have supernatural powers, they can disappear, they can get light, because they become very unselfish and all loving. So much so, you know, when, when, when those qualities arouse quality, arouse that in others who come near you, then you know you're established in that. What, what uh, a person is unselfish is established, People come near that person, they feel unselfish. They feel like they feel motivated to be uh, of service to others. So, uh, it's, I, I mean, I think this is the problem. And many of us think that uh, religion is going to um, create some sort of miracle or some magic. It's going to, uh, you know, solve the pain that I feel about this or that. It might, but that's not its main um, main emphasis. Okay. So here he says, Devakis, Avatara's mother suffered in jail. She had the while having the vision of God, she couldn't get out of jail. <laughs> M says, M, now who normally keeps quiet. M says, Why speak only of getting out of prison? This body is the source of all our troubles. Devaki should have been freed from the body. He says, why speak only of getting out of prison? This body is the source of all our troubles. Devaki should have been freed from the body. So, in uh, it's strange, you really have to keep quiet. He says something. Well, you, you, uh, the way I interpret these things is that he's talking again like, about something connected to himself. He was having his own, and was having his own problems. 
Okay, so and the master says again, uh, the truth is that one must reap the result of the prarabdha karma. The body remains as long as the results of past actions do not completely wear away. Once a blind man bathed in the Ganga and as a result was freed from his sins, but his blindness remained all the same. It was because of his evil deeds in his past birth that he had to undergo that affliction. Now, look, this is Sri Krishna saying it. Just keep, keep it at Sri Krishna saying it. If this kind of thing, if you and I say it, it becomes nonsense. You know, somebody had did something wrong, therefore they're blind now. I told you this whole business of karma is not understood at all. Sri Krishna is Sri Krishna, that's all. But we don't repeat this. You know? Um, he says, but the, the, the truth that you should take from here is, uh, one must take the results of the product of the karma, but understanding that in the way we've just discussed. The body remains as long as the results of past actions do not completely wear away. Yeah, that's right. Body was something that we chose to satisfy desire. Now, manifestation is not possible without desire. We desire it. And therefore, we find the means by which we can satisfy that desire. That is how mind evolves, that's how body evolves, according to Vedanta. And so, uh, this, this is true. Body remains as long as the results of past actions do not completely bear away. Now, here's an interesting thing too, that, um, but, but remember, the results of past actions can be neutralized by spiritual thoughts, by other actions. What is the other action? By bringing spiritual thoughts. Um, and that's why, especially, people say that uh, as the moment of uh, death approaches, spiritual thought is even more important because then you have a very powerful opportunity to affect your future. Okay, that's a subject for another day. Out of time. Any questions, comments, questions, discussion? Okay. Insights? Revelations? Is it, uh, normally I don't like to read more than one page at a time. Usually if you, if you read one page and really think deeply about it, you'll get a lot of, uh, lot of ideas. So here actually we read two plus epsilon, then it's more than two pages. And as, as usual, the way to read is uh, take notes of the interesting things, think about them. Also another thing is this, that um, there are many ways to study, but, but one thing that appeals to me, it may appeal to you too, is um, when you read something in the Kalam Ritam, it might remind you of something in another book. At that point, get that other book too, and try to see what that is. And then, uh, because putting things together, what it do, you're knitting a fabric of thought, which then becomes very solid. If you just read it in one place, you might forget it. You start connecting it to this and connecting it to that and then saying the connection between the thing, it starts becoming very solid in your mind. So then those thoughts become real to you. So therefore, it's just a very useful tool in studying. Don't study a book just in isolation, um, but try to connect, especially if you're alone. You can do this especially if you're alone. Try to connect it with other things. What does this Upanishad say about it? What does Gita say about it? Uh, what does Swami Vedanta say about it? Um, and so all of those things will help us really impress this deeply in our mind. Good. Okay. <laughs> 